Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Ron Lewis. I'm the panel aid chair for the Medical Board of California, and this is what we designate as panel A meeting. Um, we have several items of a bu business to take care of during open session, so the procedure will be we will do our open session items first. We will have hear cases, but at some point we will ask the members in the audience to exit the room. So it's going to be back and forth. So, But many of you have been through this anyway. So I welcome you. Um, I'd like for um, the members to um, state their names as we go down the room so the court reporter um, can see. So if we start on my left. Sorry, I was thinking to start with the kitten roll. Oh, I was going to do that after this. It's all right, whatever you'd like. Um, we, can signif we can start taking roll. So, and then we'll do my thing. So would you please take roll? <coughs> Here. Here. Mr. Warmoth? Here. Mr. Watkins? Yeah. Dr. Yip? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. We have a quorum. Okay. Will the members from my left down please state your name so the court reporter um, can hear you? Is Rick T.J. Watkins? Lori Rose Lubiano? Ronald H. Lewis. David Warmoth. Randy Hawkins. Okay, so good for you? Great, okay. The next order of business after we had roll call is to elect panel A chair and vice chair for this coming year. So I'd like to ask if there are any nominations for Panel A Chair, and I'll start on my left. Dr. Yip. Okay, thank you. I accept. Any other nomination? Okay, nominations are closed. Uh, <laughs> could I have a, a roll call vote, please, or make it an unanimous? All those in favor of me being chair? Aye. 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 Anybody say nay? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> that was easy. Now we go on to the position of vice chair. And so are there any nominations for vice chair? I'll start on my left. David Warmoth has been nominated. Anybody else? Nominations are closed. So I'd like um, a vote on the Vice Chair, David Warmoth. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, and congratulations to David for being Vice Chair. There you go. <laughs> okay, the next order of business, um, uh, will be to introduce the ALJ, who will then take over the um, oral argument session of our meeting. So I'd like for her to introduce herself and state any rules that she has regarding the <laughs> process. Okay. Um, my name is Administrative Law Judge Teresa Brell. I work for the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I'm, I'm going to be presiding over uh, the oral arguments today. Uh, what's going to happen, and, and we can talk about this once we open the record on each one of them as well, is uh, in each case there's two different cases we have today, and one's at 2 o'clock, one's at 3.15. In each case what will happen is I'll open the record, I'll ask the parties that are here for those cases to uh, uh, make their appearance and introduce themselves. And then um, the petitioner, if the petitioner is here or the petitioner's attorney is here, will have 15 minutes to make oral argument. Uh, then the uh, deputy attorney general 
will have 15 minutes to do oral argument and then each party will have five minutes time for rebuttal. Uh, and this is, these are oral arguments of um, regarding decisions that were not adopted by the medical board and there are to be arguments based on the uh, information that is in the record from a prior hearing that was before an administrative law judge. So it's not a time when the parties are going to add new information. They're going to be uh, presenting argument about, um, about their cases. Um, and so, but after the petitioner, after each party does their initial 15 minutes of, of and I'm going to time it as best I can with my cell phone here. I'll see if any of the board panel members would like to ask any questions about uh, the party's arguments that they've made. And one thing that I'd ask that, that you all do is if you can state your name right before you ask a question, if you have one, that's really helpful to the court reporter um, because then she doesn't have to squint and try to see your name even though you did state your name for her. Um, that would be another additional thing. Now once out, all the arguments are done, any questions are done, then the, the record will be closed and then that's when we'll go in closed session on each one. Uh, and then everyone will have to leave the room except for the board and I think the board's attorney and me. So the court reporter will have to leave too because that won't be transcribed. And then there's another one at 3.15, okay? So um, unless there's something else you wanna do, I think I'm gonna go on the record on the first one. All right, so if you could, let's, uh, Go on the record. Uh, the record is now open in the matter of the petition for reduction of penalty of Victor Delgado Contreras. Um, and it's the medical board's case number 800-2018-041396. It has office of administrative hearings case number 2019-050339. I also noticed that when this was scheduled, the Office of Administrative Hearings gave it a new case number. So there's going to be a sheet that the parties are going to get from the court reporter and I wrote the old case number on it because the new case number is also on there. But there's a new OAH case number, it's 2019-100258 and I just mentioned that because if anyone wants to order a transcript or get information from Office of Administrative Hearings, I want you to be aware there's two case numbers on that form. Um, this proceeding is being held on November 6th of 2019 uh, before Panel A of the Medical Board of California. There's a quorum of the, of the panel present. I am Administrative Law Judge Teresa Brell. I work for the Office of Administrative Hearings and I will be presiding over uh, this oral argument proceeding. Now first let's have appearances for the Attorney General's Office. And is uh, Dr. Contreras here? Uh, Ms. Westfall, have you heard from him? Do you know if he's going to be here? Uh, I've not heard from him. Okay. Well, it's after 2 o'clock, and so I guess we can assume he's not coming because he received notice. Um, so uh, I don't know if you'll need your full 15 or uh, your full 20 minutes or I'll not. Take it. Okay. No. I'm going to try to um, time it with my <laughs> cell phone and give you a warning when we get close to the end. Do you want to do just told 20, 15 minutes and take a break? or? Get questions, or do you think you want the whole 20? I'll give you I don't think I'll take the full 20, but okay. I'll go till I'm done and then I'll see if there's any questions. Okay, so I'll just sit, give you 20 minutes okay. and then we'll go. Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here on a petition for a reinstatement of license. And while the board has asked for our argument from both sides, I'd always like to point out that in these proceedings, the burden rests fully on the petitioner, not on on the Attorney General's office. He has the burden of showing by clear and convincing evidence of rehabilitation to overcome your prior adverse judgment against him. The petitioner, the party seeking to have his probation terminated six years early, did not even prepare a written statement for your review today. The petitioner, the party who holds the burden in this case, is not even here today to explain to you, his licensing board, why you should grant his petition. When looking to determine whether or not you should grant a petition in these instances, the California Code of Regulations provides that the board can consider a variety of factors. And one of those factors you can consider is the severity of the underlying acts that brought on his discipline to begin with. 
So that makes a lot of sense because you have to ask yourself, how much evidence has he shown us to overcome those prior acts that he was disciplined for? And when you look at Dr. Contreras' disciplinary history with this board, I'm sure the first thing that jumped out to you as it did to me is that this is not the first time he has been before the board. This was not his first stint of probation. In 1999, he was convicted of domestic violence and he was also engaged in record keeping violations uh, he engaged in during the care of his own girlfriend. And he was placed on probation by this board for four years. During that initial stint of probation, he was suspended for, from practice for 30 days. He had a practice monitor. He was ordered to complete an ethics course and a prescribing practices course. He completed that full four-year stint of probation in 2003. Now, despite the board's efforts to protect the public from his, that prior instance, despite the board's efforts to rehabilitate him, he continued to engage in unprofessional conduct in the exact same setting. His private solo practice family medicine clinic that he's worked in since 1989. After that stint of probation, in 2011, the DEA instituted an investigation against Dr. Contreras after they arrested an employee of his who claimed that Dr. Contreras was providing drugs to patients in exchange for sex. The DEA conducted a search of his practice in 2012 and found that he was not storing or logging drugs correctly. They found a back room in his clinic that had, for an unknown reason, a bed, patient files, and cabinets containing expired medications. They found a drawer full of crumpled, haphazardly placed receipts for controlled substances that he had sold out of his clinic. Sometime after that search, he surrendered his DEA license for cause, not out of the goodness of his heart, because he was in violation of their rules and regulations too. Now during the medical board's investigation at that time, they focused on his care and treatment of seven different patients. Seven patients, one of which was who his sons referred to as his fiance, a woman whose initials were CJ. He excessively prescribed controlled substances to CJ over a period of 10 years. And when questioned about his care and treatment of this patient, he defended the propriety of his treatment by saying, quote, well, she's not dead. In February of 2014, the board filed an accusation against Dr. Contreras for the care and treatment he rendered to all seven of those patients. Many of the allegations in the accusation were about his prescribing practices but not all of them. With all seven patients, he failed to adequately, adequately perform a history and physical, he failed to formulate a treatment plan, and he failed to obtain informed consent for his treatment. With one patient, he failed to appropriately treat her high blood pressure and high cholesterol, the bread and butter of a family medicine practitioner. He also failed to send a patient with hepatitis C for testing, despite an obvious comp compromised liver. The accusation charged him with over 70 allegations of gross negligence. That's seven zero allegations. They also charged him with incompetence, failure to maintain adequate records, excessive prescribing, prescribing without an appropriate exam, violation of drug statutes, dispensing drugs without proper labeling, and general unprofessional conduct. That is how Dr. Contreras was practicing medicine after completing probation with this board. That is how Dr. Contreras was practicing medicine after taking a prescribing practices course. That is how Dr. Contreras was practicing medicine after having a practice monitor for four years. He resolved that accusation by way of a stipulated settlement and the board's decision became effective in February of 2015. This board placed him on probation for 10 years, subject to various terms and conditions, including prescribing prohibitions, a prohibition that he not write any uh, recommendations for marijuana, 
that he be ordered to complete another prescribing practices course, another ethics course, a record keeping course, and to have another practice monitor for the full 10 year stint of probation. After just three years, he filed the instant petition to terminate his probation early. So that's the history of his case. And now you must weigh that against any evidence of rehabilitation that he's produced to you. So he's not here, but at the underlying hearing, what evidence did he show? When you read the transcript as I did, you must have seen that he called zero witnesses to testify on his behalf. He provided two letters of recommendation, the bare minimum required by statute. The first letter was written by his practice monitor, who incidentally was a former colleague of his. In this letter, the practice monitor provided examples of how petitioner has reached reformation. And those examples cited in the letter were that he no longer performs grocery store consults, that he no longer prescribes medications without first performing a history and physical, something he should have been doing all along. And this was the best, that he now wears a white coat when meeting with patients to maintain professional boundaries. Those are the examples cited as to why his probation should be terminated. That is how low his practice monitor sets the bar in this case. There is no need for your oversight, he suggests. There is, patients are adequately safe because for goodness sake, he wears a white coat to work. The second letter was written by someone who used to work in the, with him in the pain management field. Someone who is currently on probation by this board. And incredulously, the ALJ and the underlying hearing found that this physician witnesses current disciplinary hearing, what, excuse me, current disciplinary history was not relevant. Ladies and gentlemen, witness credibility in our hearings is always relevant. And when a physician is placed on probation by their licensing board, whether it be for similar violations or for dishonesty or incompetence, this is something the board should know and consider when evaluating the veracity of that witness and determining how much weight to give their opinion, if any. The ALJ found in her decision that the petitioner had somehow demonstrated himself to be a quote, competent, highly regarded physician. To be clear, since he called no witnesses, the ALJ had to make that determination based on those two letters alone. Two sheets of paper allegedly written by people who didn't even come forth and testify on his behalf and who were not subject to cross-examination, someone he used to work with, and someone on probation. Of course, the petitioner testified on his own behalf, and he told us he's rehabilitated. He claimed there's no longer any need for oversight because he's no longer practicing as a pain management physician. He surrendered his DEA license so he can't prescribe controlled substances and he's no longer in a high risk setting since he is a family practice physician and sees low risk patients. Of course, he's been in the same family practice setting since 1989, that has not changed. And of course, it's not only high risk patients who require and deserve good competent care. Patients with say, oh, I don't know, high blood pressure and high cholesterol also deserve good competent care. And that is the exact type of patient that didn't receive it from him in this case. He claims he's complied with all terms and conditions of probation, many of which he's doing for a second time. Yet on cross-examination at the underlying hearing, he admitted to writing a recommendation to a minor for marijuana for anxiety. This was of course directly contrary to his probation, which states, respondent shall not issue an oral or written recommendation for approval to a patient for the possession of marijuana for personal medical purposes. Giving him the benefit of the doubt that he misunderstood that term of his probation, let's suppose for a moment that he's complied with all of his terms of probation thus far. I mean, that's pretty much his argument. I've done what you've asked me to do, it's been four years. So you must ask yourself as the board deciding this case, is that enough evidence to overcome his prior adverse conduct? 
is proof of compliance with probation and not one more thing, strong enough proof of rehabilitation to overcome your prior adverse judgment? And I suggest to you that the answer to that question is absolutely no. The protection of the public is your highest priority. He is here on not his first, but his second stint of probation because he clearly did not learn what he needed to in his first round of probation. In the first stint, he was given four years, which clearly wasn't enough to rehabilitate him because he found himself here again. So the second time, he's given 10 years. 10 years was deemed by you, his licensing board, to be sufficient amount of oversight to ensure public protection. And now he's here today, well, personally not, but uh, saying, hey, I've done less than half of that time. No, seriously, I did four years this time too. I got the message this time. In the proposed decision, the ALJ found that, quote, the chance of recidivism by petitioner is very low. The public interest is not at risk by terminating his probation before it is due to expire by its own terms. Recidivism, the likelihood of reoffending, she determined, was low. The best indicator of future conduct is past conduct. And by definition, the petitioner is a recidivist. Oversight and monitoring was and continues to be necessary for a physician who's erred again and again, who has been given chances in the past and who continue to engage in unprofessional conduct. Over 70 allegations of gross negligence, 70. He may have shown some evidence of rehabilitation by complying with most of his terms of probation, but there's no truer indication of rehabilitation than sustained conduct over a period of time. Four years was not enough the first time, and it is not enough this time. We ask that you deny his petition. Thank you. Woo. You did it in less than 15 <laughs> minutes. Uh, do, do any of the panel members have any questions? I'm seeing no. Oh, oh go ahead, doctor. I just want to, um, this is uh, Dr. Lewis. I just want to ask again, your issue with the board, or is it the issue with the ALJ, is that the, is it the ALJ um, uh, placed a not as stringent uh, penalty as she should have and allowed his license to be reinstated? Or what is your um, issue? So in a petition to terminate probation, the licensee has to show he's rehabilitated. And my issue is that the ALJ took very little evidence in that case and somehow, to me, made an erroneous finding that he was rehabilitated. That clarifies. That's what I thought. Thank you. Any other questions? Doesn't look like there's any other questions. Um, well, then uh, the record's closed, and uh, then the board's going to have to go into closed session. But before everyone, you, you, Ms. Westfeld, are you going to be for, here for the other proceeding? Okay, before you leave, let's g make sure you get the form from the court reporter. Okay. okay. The, the, um, the panel, uh, we'd already established we have a quorum of the panel because this is the second oral argument we've had. So let's go on the record. Uh, the record is now open in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of Lawrence Robert Cronin uh, before the uh, before panel A of the Medical Board of California, case number 800-2018-048008, Office of Administrative Hearings, case number 20190503390. Now, at the end of the hearing of uh, the parties, you're going to get a form that's a, that's a, that tells you how to order a transcript. And you will notice on that that also written on that form is another OAH number that for some reason OAH assigned to the case. So I made sure that you have both numbers. I don't know if, if you need them both or not. But the newly assigned OAH case number is 20190509922. 
This hearing is being held on November 6 of 2019 in San Diego, California. I am Administrative Law Judge Teresa Brell. I work for the Office of Administrative Hearings and I'm presiding over this um, oral argument. Now, um, the way that, well, let's have appearances first for the uh, petitioner. Good morning, Nicholas Jerkowitz on behalf of the petitioner, Dr. Cronin, and present with me is Dr. Cronin. Okay, and can everyone hear him? Because the mic sometimes, if you don't talk right into it, it doesn't always pick it up, I guess. All right, and for the district, uh, the Attorney General's office? Good afternoon, Deputy Attorney General Christine Rhee on behalf of the people of the state of California. Oh, hello, Ms. Rhee. Um, all right, let me go over the procedures with uh, both of you. We had had another proceeding and we talked about the procedures there, but we have new people here to, right now. Uh, what's gonna happen is petitioner is gonna have 15 minutes to do an initial argument. Uh, then the Deputy Attorney General will have 15 minutes. Um, and then the petitioner will be given five minutes for rebuttal and the Deputy Attorney General will be given five minutes for rebuttal. Um, I'm gonna time you and give you some, uh, like a warning when you're getting close to the end of your time because the medical board wants you to stay within your time limit. Uh, one question I have for you, Mr. Jerkowitz, is, is Mr. Cronin, is he gonna wanna speak to the board? Uh, Dr. Cronin will, um, is available to answer any questions, but he does not have a prepared uh, statement okay. of any kind. But he's Mr. Cronin, right? Because he doesn't have his license right now. Sure. Okay. Yes. But all right. So um, just just let me know if he want if you decide you want to address. I'll I'll swear him in if he's going to ask any qu answer questions. Yes, I think that's a good idea. Okay. Well, maybe let me swear you in just in case it comes up, so I don't forget. And Mr. Cronin, would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today, if you do give any, will be the truth under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of California? I do. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, Mr. Jerkowitz, it's your turn to make your initial argument. Both parties need to keep in mind that your argument is arguing based on the record of the prior hearing that you had. It's not a time to present new evidence. Um, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try to time you on the phone and we'll let you know if you're getting close to running out of time, okay, sir? Thank you, Your Honor. All right, go ahead. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nicholas Jerkwitz, as I said. I'm here representing Mr. Cronin. And the issue, uh, as we understand it from the board, is whether or not the, well, we're here for a petition for reinstatement. And um, the proposed decision was to grant reinstatement with five years probation and some specific terms within that. And the issue here today is whether or not the discipline recommended by the proposed decision is um, sufficient to protect the public. And that's what I will be addressing here uh, right now. Um, obviously, if you have specific issues with the proposed decision, please let me know and I'll address those specifically as will um, Mr. Cronin. The issue here is a, um, a occurrence that took place uh, more than five years ago, uh, over the course of five to six years ago of an inappropriate relationship between Mr. Cronin and a patient of his in um, Arizona. And the, since that time, uh, Mr. Cronin has engaged in extensive rehabilitative efforts. And I'd like to outline those to you today to demonstrate why he has been fully rehabilitated and is deserving of his license. And the specific terms of this probation are more than adequate to protect the public. So if I could draw your attention to page five of our papers, I outline in somewhat detail with citations to the record of the specific rehabilitation that Dr. Cronin has gone through, and I'll go through that right now. Uh, Dr. Cronin has gone through um, an extensive monitoring program with Dr. Sucher, who's a well-known, recognized uh, practice uh, monitor of physicians. He monitors substance abuse and situations like this. Um, Mr. Cronin has gone through that, that program, uh, for a number of years now, and um, Dr. Sucher's program includes not only meeting with Mr. Cronin on a regular basis to monitor him, but also includes random uh, drug urine toxicology screenings, all of which uh, Mr. Cronin has fully passed. And I just want to highlight from the record, Dr. Sucher testified, and this is on page um, 
44 of the transcript from the record um, in which he was uh, testifying with regard to a letter he had written on behalf of Dr. Cronin, which was Exhibit 7. Um, and in it, Dr. Sutcher stated, in the 25 plus years that I have been working with physicians who have been impaired by other substance use disorders, mental health issues, and or professional boundaries, I have not known an individual who has been so assertive on his own behalf to recover, improve, and become the best human being he can become. So Dr. Sutcher gave a full um, endorsement of Mr. Cronin to have his license reinstated with certain terms. Um, in addition to that, uh, Mr. Cronin has participated in 1,000 um, step programs, including logs for many of those meetings, and that's Exhibit H. Um, uh, he took polygraph tests, certificates, degrees, and CMEs through 2018. That's Exhibits 4 and 5. Uh, we presented numerous letters of letters of recommendation from uh, a number of individuals, uh, professionals and non-professionals, who fully endorsed uh, Mr. Cronin and his um, uh, competency to get his license back. He's undergone extensive personal psychotherapy uh, over the last five to six years concerning uh, these issues. Um, he's also engaged in couples therapy with his wife to improve his relationship. And most importantly, uh, Dr. Mr. Cronin engaged in a 45-day residential treatment at Pine Grove in the Gratitude Program, and that's Exhibit B to the record. He engaged in 30 days intensive outpatient treatment at the Pine Grove after completion of the residential treatment. So he's gone through an inpatient rehab program and then an outpatient rehab program. He also um, participates on a regular basis with Pine Grove, which is a nationally um, rec recognized um, program that treats certain boundary issues like this and se sexual misconduct issues. And he's continued to be part of that program and continued to engage in follow-up um, visits to the program to continue to be monitored. Um, has had complete abstinence of alcohol since August 1st, 2017. Um, and he's also completed two separate boundary courses. So the record is very clear that within the standards of California, uh, Mr. Cronin has met the requirements for rehabilitation. So the issue then here is whether or not the discipline is appropriate. The, the only issue is an inappropriate relationship with one patient over a 25 plus year career, um, one patient, a, a female patient. And I would highlight that the specific terms of this probation require a chaperone to be present uh, during probation when Mr. Cronin treats a female patient. And I think that based upon that, plus a continued monitoring, the uh, decision calls for continued monitoring with Dr. Sutcher. So we have continued monitoring, and we have a third-party chaperone present when treating females. So again, this is a fully competent physician who engaged in, in, in one very inappropriate relationship. The program, the probation would rec require continued monitoring and third-party chaperone. So it, it seems that the public would be fully um, protected uh, from any potential future misconduct. I would also like to highlight a few other things. Um, earlier this year, in March of 2019, uh, in the matter of Quach, Q-U-A-C-H, case number 800-2016-021229, it's a case that was adopted by the board in March of 2019, and it is um, very similar circumstances with a physician there. Um, that physician was an ob gyn not uh, a psychiatrist, but the physician engaged in an inappropriate relationship with a patient over approximately a year, which is very similar to what happened here. And in that case, the board adopted a, uh, a stipulated settlement that called for three years probation uh, under Judge, very- I'm gonna object to the, the references to this other case. They're not in the administrative record in this case. And the argument should be limited to that. Is this a precedent decision by the medical board? If it's not a precedent, it's not a precedent decision. Yeah, unless it's an appellate decision or a precedent decision, I don't think you should be arguing it as some sort of precedent. So maybe oh. we can move on. Okay. And and on that, I'll I'll submit that uh, the.
decision more than adequately protects the public. Dr. Cronin has demonstrated remorse. Um, he's admitted what happened. He didn't deny it. He's done everything he can as possible to learn from it, to learn skills, and to get the rehabilitation help he needs. And it's now been between five and six years since the event occurred. And with the terms of probation, including monitoring and chaperone, um, the public is more than adequately protected. And it's a five-year probation, so it's, it's sub pretty substantive. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Ms. Ree, your argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, at first, I want to remind the panel of the relevant law and regulation describing what the board should consider in these types of petition for reinstatement proceedings. The first is Business and Professions Code Section 2307, Subdivision E. Uh, that states that the board may consider all activities of the petitioner since the disciplinary action was taken, the offense for which the petitioner was disciplined, the petitioner's activities during the time the certificate was in good standing, and the petitioner's rehabilitative efforts and general reputation for truth and professional ability. The regulation that is relevant to today's hearing is Title 16 of California Code of Regulations, Section 1360.2 that gives rehabilitation criteria that the board may consider. Um, that Those include under that regulation the nature and severity of the acts under consideration as grounds for discipline, evidence of any acts or uh, crimes committed in subsequent to the acts under consideration as grounds for discipline, um, the time that has elapsed since the commission of the acts and evidence of any of rehabilitation. So in total, uh, the severity and the nature of the acts that cause the discipline must be weighed against the rehabilitation demonstrated at the administrative hearing when determining what kind of discipline is appropriate in this case. So uh, Mr. Jerkowitz um, summarized the rehabilitation that Mr. Cronin went through, so I'm, I'm not going to go through that, and it's in his papers as well. Um, he has proven that he has done a lot to rehabilitate himself, but the question to be determined by the board is whether he's done enough um, to overcome his original misconduct. And as Mr. Jerkowitz stated, the, the conduct occurred uh, between five and six years ago. So I want to focus on the nature and severity of the underlying acts um, that were the cause for this case. So the first amended accusation in California was based on out-of-state discipline from Arizona in which the petitioner, who was then a psychiatrist, admitted to committing sexual misconduct with a patient for approximately one year from September 2013 through September 2014. According to the record, this patient had established care with Mr. Cronin in 2008. Problems began from the start uh, when p the petitioner promised the patient that he would nev never hospitalize her against her will or abandon her. Petitioner then took over her psychotherapy from her psychotherapist and offered to do email sessions um, with the patient when she moved out of the country for a year-long sabbatical. During the email communication, petitioner began revealing parts of his personal life to the patient, uh, signing off on his emails as Lorenzo instead of Dr. Cronin. At some point, uh, the petitioner's wife saw one of the email communications and warned him that he needed supervision on the case. Petitioner did that, and he testified that things had improved for a time with the patient, but he reverted back to revealing personal details um, to the patient and having visits that ran over time. The patient offered to edit a book for petitioner uh, that he was writing and he accepted that. Um, they started meeting each other at the library and soon after that a sexual relationship um, started. According to the petitioner's own testimony at the administrative hearing, the patient continued to see him for psychotherapy after the sexual relationship started um, from September through January. He continued to treat the pa patient as her psychiatrist until May of uh, 2014 when he switched her to another psychiatrist. Uh, petitioner lied to the patient's husband when the, the husband confronted the petitioner about his inappropriate relationship with his wife. Um, and the relationship stopped ultimately when the patient sued the petitioner and the Arizona Medical Board started their own investigation which ultimately led to their discipline through an interim practice restriction and eventual license surrender. So here we see repeated boundary violations and warnings that were raised along the way by two third parties, uh, the petitioner's wife and then his supervisor, who was supposed to be supervising this case. 
Despite these third party interventions, which should have given petitioner some sense of the inappropriateness of his actions and the major boundary violations he was committing, he still ultimately had sex with the patient and maintained that relationship for a year. These failures to heed warnings and accept outside help weighs heavily in the Attorney General's calculation of how to best protect the public moving forward. It is especially troubling giving petitioner's specialty, which is psychiatry, which would place him in a position that would make him more susceptible to situations involving transference and possibly more susceptible to future sexual misconduct. Ultimately, the Attorney General and the Board's utmost concern in this matter is to protect the public, and that includes doing everything in the Board's power to prevent this type of patient harm from occurring in the future. Representing the people of the state of California and weighing the rehabilitation presented against the gravity of petitioner's misconduct, the Attorney General's position and recommendation is that the Board should deny the petition for re reinstatement outright. The petitioner did not meet his burden of clear and convincing evidence to show that he has rehabilitated himself and is entitled to have his license restored. If the board is inclined to give petitioner a probationary license, however, the board must add terms and conditions to what was proposed in the administrative law judge's draft decision. The ALJ proposed issuing a probationary license for five years with monitoring under Dr. Sutcher, um, abstention from controlled substances and alcohol, psychotherapy, third party chaperone for female patients, 12 step group meetings, uh, solo practice prohibition, and the standard terms and conditions of probation. If the board were inclined to grant petitioners prob a probationary license, the Attorney General's position is that the following terms must be added to those listed in the proposed decision in order to adequately protect the public. The first is the disclosure of probation of uh, Mr. Cronin's probation status to patients pursuant to Business and Professions Code Section 2228.1 and a practice monitor. So Business and Professions Code Section 2228.1 um, just went into effect on July 1st, 2019. This is a mandatory term should the board issue a probationary license in this kind of case, which is a sexual misconduct case. Um, there is no guidance in the current version of the board's disciplinary guidelines giving a proposed language for this disclosure requirement, um, but we, we've provided in our papers proposed language um, which can be specifically found in pages 10 and 11 of our, our papers. The second condition uh, that must be included is a probation monitor. Um, the board's disciplinary guidelines recommend a practice and or billing monitor for violations of business and professions code section 726, which is sexual misconduct. Um, but here in this case, since there have been no allegations of inappropriate billing, our, it's the attorney general's position that a billing monitor isn't necessary, but a practice monitor certainly is. Um, from the administrative record, the, the testimony from the petitioner's um, current monitor, Dr. Sucher, um, the latest recommendations from Pine Grove, which um, his latest report was from March of 2019, which were, these were received um, and admitted during the administrative hearing. They all support um, including a practice monitor as a term of probation. When petitioner testified at the hearing, uh, he explained the circumstances that made him more susceptible to violating boundaries with the patient and the risk factors involved that were involved. He stated that at the time he had low accountability for his work after his busy private practice had collapsed and that quote, I had no one watching what I was doing in my practice. That's found in the um, transcript on page 119. He also stated at the hearing that if he was allowed to practice again, he would seek out supervision on his cases. That could be found on page 129, lines 10 through 11 of the, the transcript of the hearing. Additionally, in his, in his testimony at the hearing, Dr. Sucher agreed that it was appropriate to have an evaluation of petitioner's status as he re returned to work, how he was performing, and how he was doing on the job. That can be found in Dr. Sucher's testimony on page 54, line 8 of the hearing transcript. Um, he also opined that the petitioner was safe to practice with monitoring. A practice monitor would review petitioner's charts, speak to him on a regular basis, and evaluate his performance throughout the term of probation. A practice monitor would also keep the board informed of whether the petitioner is practicing medicine safely. Should the petitioner ever start overstepping boundaries with patients in the future, a practice monitor could potentially identify any issues and report them directly back to the board for disciplinary action. Um, it should also be noted that 
Although the Arizona license surrender was effective in June of 2015, petitioner testified at the hearing that he stopped practicing in his private practice around Christmas of 2014 to go to Pine Grove for treatment. Um, he's been out of practice for almost five years and having a practice monitor in place would allow the board to ensure that the quality of care that petitioner was providing to patients are up to the current standards of care. And with that, the Attorney General will submit. So Mr. Jerkowitz, you ready to do your, um, any rebuttal? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I'm a little bit surprised that uh, on behalf of the people, she requested um, that this petition be denied. At the hearing, the attorney representing the medical board um, agreed that Dr. Cronin, Mr. Cronin submitted enough evidence that um, he should have his license reinstated with certain particular probationary terms. And in the papers they filed here today, they also, um, on behalf of the people, the Deputy Attorney General submitted that Dr. Mr. Cronin's license should be reinstated with probationary terms along with the additional terms that she's referenced here today. We have no problem with adding those terms. I, I, I think that if the board felt that those terms are necessary to protect the public, then those terms can be added. But again, your, the board's job is to determine what's necessary to protect the public and not to punish practitioners or potential practitioners. In this case, you have extensive rehabilitation. We have a number of professionals in the record, tr professionals who've treated him. I didn't cite to them all. There's Dr. Sucher. There's his specific um, therapists. There's people from the Pine Grove um, uh, uh, Rehabilitation Program. They all submitted documentation that demonstrated overwhelmingly they believed him to be rehabilitated and safe to practice medicine. The only factor that could possibly weigh against giving him a license with probationary terms is the conduct itself. But that should not be the only factor. That factor is serious, and there's no doubt the conduct was serious. But that should be balanced against everything else in this case. The documentary evidence of extensive rehabilitation, and at this point today, he's a different person than he was six years ago. And with that, he should be allowed to have a license and the public will be more than adequately protected with all of the terms in place, particularly a third party chaperone. And if the board determines that it is appropriate with the additional monitoring um, and the notification to the patients. Thank you. Ms. Ree, any, any rebuttal? Yes, Judge, briefly. Um, certainly the Attorney General's office uh, believes that the severity of the, the underlying actions isn't the only thing that the panel should consider. Um, but I wanted to make it clear how egregious the behavior was underlying this case, and that should be held uh, and compared to the rehabilitation that um, petitioner has demonstrated at the hearing. Um, again, because the, the, the behavior was so serious, egregious, it was sexual misconduct with a patient, it occurred for over a year, um, it wasn't disclosed by him to, to, any, to the board, it was found out through other means. Um, it is our position that as looking out for the public and the public's protection, that again, the petition should be denied. But if it is not gonna be denied, if a license will be issued, we must include those two terms that I've described before. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm gonna open this up for any questions from the panel. And it would be really helpful to the court reporter if you have questions, if you would state your name. Go ahead, doctor. Oh, Mr. Watkins, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, TJ Watkins. Hi, good afternoon. Um, will Mr. C Dr. Crowden be answering the question? If you'd like, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Well, I've got a list of questions, and thank you for showing up. <laughs> first things. So my first question is, that this event occurred in Arizona, am I correct? Yes. Yes. And my second question is, after all of this, when you, you, were, um, you chose to go to Pine Grove, the facility, the rehabilitation facility, Pine Grove, after that, and then you were released from the program before it was completed. Is that correct? Yes. 
And the reason for that was a boundary violation. Yes. And a boundary violation, can you explain to all of us what that means uh, in your language? Because I read in, the t- in those 600 pages that you are writing a book about it. So I'm very keen to understand your understanding of a boundary violation. That particular boundary violation or just in general? What just are? in general. Um, I haven't ap- actually operationalized it in my mind, but uh, I've come to realize that I had poor boundaries, especially with this patient, and uh, that I have discovered boundary issues are throughout society and throughout the profession. And um, in going to the courses that I took, I realized that many things that I actually thought were good quality care were actually boundary violations. For example, giving my phone number out to patients. I thought that was actually helping their access to me. And in in there I learned that those are very bad ones. I learned that revealing much about me is is a bad idea. That uh, revealing um, just interesting things or asking patients for advice in any way is almost like romanticizing a relationship with a patient and putting an undue burden on them. Um, I, uh, yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> so you associate the undue influence. Would you describe that as being manipulative? Yes. Um, oh. I was unaware that I was manipulating her per se when I was treating her as a patient, but I believe that any time that you reveal personal information to patients, you're you're placing a burden on them. Uh, I've had it happen to me as a patient since then, and I've had my own therapist ask me for advice on one of his cases, and I was like shocked that he did it, and I was actually hurt, And and that was a simple, type of boundary violation that he made. And I addressed it with him and he apologized and he said, I need to watch my own boundaries more closely. Um, something like that. And the reason why I asked that question is because something jumped at me and you actually clarified it further when you were speaking about boundary violations in the record on the 600 pages. And this was it, with your lead expert, the lead expert, Dr. Schutter, yeah, as in, did I pronounce that correctly? <laughs> Sucher. Sucher. When asked in the proceeding, the preview, the prior proceeding, whether there was a chance that you will re-offend, he said that there was a, a null chance that you will re-defend. And that jumped at me. And that made me explore, and, yeah, and I will explain why. Because when someone make such a statement when, uh, I mean, can I ask you, do you think it is possible that this could happen again to you? I think anything is possible, but I think it's extremely unlikely. And you see, so that is more of an objective answer. But the expert here, Dr. Schutter, or Shutter, he said no. So so I explored, okay, okay, I look closer to Dr. Schutter. And then I look at the record, and when I look at the record, I saw that when you were admitted to Pine Grove in 2015, they had a list of requirements for when they um, let uh, let you go from the program, right? Yes. And then I looked at that same program at the end of your last visit, and the list didn't change significantly. All of those things were pretty much the same for a bar few things. I can be detailed if I go to the record, but in just to make up for time, they were essentially not different. So then I asked myself the question, and this is the question, is it possible that you could have manipulated Dr. Schutter into a relationship of a different kind, that he would depart from his professional judgment to make a very easy call in a, in a proceeding that asks, from his professional judgment, 
whether you would be able, to, whether this would happen again. And the correct answer, and there is a correct answer, oh, it would okay. at least let be me, possible. Let me interrupt a minute. I want everyone to remember that what the board needs to decide is based on the evidence in the record. Yes, this is in the record. And there was an expert that testified on the record, and sometimes board members have their own opinions about things, but I don't think it's appropriate now to be having a debate with Mr. Cronin about what the expert said during the underlying hearing. We, we really need to focus this on not, we're not here to present additional evidence, and you're, you're asking the, Mr. Cronin to give you his opinions about things that another party, another witness testified, so I don't think this is an appropriate line of inquiry. So maybe we, maybe we can move on. Do you have any other questions? Yes, I do. The second question that I have, pertains to that whether this, you, you see you revealed a lot of stuff in the record about, you know, uh, Pine Grove and the boundary violations and the excessive number of courses that you take. That is really impressive, right? The question is, when you took all these cases, did you recognize more elements that makes you a greater risk at the time or makes you a lesser risk today? When you discover these other elements, you talk about these uh, characteristics about yourself, the 17. Uh, again, again, sir, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but I, I do want Mr. Cronin to get a chance to answer questions, but I don't think this forum is appropriate time to debate with him on things that aren't in the record. Under the regulations, the petitioner's allowed to d talk to the, the board regarding the penalty, but we're really not here to, ex to expound and uh, create an additional record regarding his opinions about these things. You really, you're, you're really bound by the evidence that was presented at the hearing. It causes a problem for both parties because the de Deputy Attorney General's office isn't have, doesn't have a witness here to respond to anything he says. He's not subject to cross-examination. So I don't really think this whole line of questioning is appropriate for today. Okay, then we'll, my final question. Can we move down here? Sure, sure. Know? I'll just go and then we can come back. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Dr. Hawkins. And so this may not be something that can be answered either. Uh, so my question really revolves around Dr. Sutra and his support for Mr. Crow. And obviously, he spent a lot of time with him and plans to continue to uh, be involved in this therapy. And there was a statement suggesting Dr. Sutra believes that. Um, Mrs. Cronin is very, very much rehabilitated and I believe said something to the effect of uh, suggesting that maybe more rehabilitation uh, than any other patient he's had in sexual misconduct, um, drug and alcohol abuse. And my question is, did he subdivide at all the risk of recidivism or repeated behavior in drug abuse, alcohol abuse versus sexual misconduct. Are you asking Mr. Jerkowitz about what's in the record? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay, so maybe he can cite you to something in the record. My recollection is that he did not um, subdivide it in any way. A any other questions? Mr. Lewis, or Dr. Lewis, sorry. I have one main question. And just on your mic, please. It is on. Even closer? <laughs> I'll have it for dinner. Um, okay. Uh, in 2013 was the beginning of the, quote, offense, the sexual um, um, misconduct with a patient, correct? To around 2013? Yes. And I have from the record that it terminated in 2014? Yes. And you transferred care of that patient to another 
psychiatrist, and yep. the re and the reason you did that was. Um, I knew the relationship was wrong with the patient, and I broke it off. I broke it off three times. That time, when I broke it off, she was so hurt that she did not want to see me any longer, and asked that I find her another psychiatrist, and I did. Okay, that's all I wanted to make sure. Thank you. A any other questions from any other panel members? Oh, okay. And I don't. S please stay your name. Uh, David Warmoth. Uh, my question basically is that uh, how long has it been since uh, you uh, surrendered your license in California? I believe I did it in August of 2015. And do you ha are you licensed in any other state? No. Uh, what have you been doing to keep uh, abreast of, uh, well, I guess, do you feel you're qualified to step back in, uh, or do you need to uh, rehabilitate that side of uh, your knowledge base as well? Um, I do believe I'm qualified to go back to practice. Um, I have done close to 100 hours of CME every year. I continue to read about psychiatry regularly. I was very well trained to begin with. I was a highly regarded psychiatrist in my clinical skills. And um, my wife is a practicing psychiatrist and developing a really interesting psychiatric model in Santa Cruz. Uh, and we talk about psychiatry daily. So I don't really feel I'm all that far away from the field. Any, any other questions? OK, Mr. Is it Martin again? Walk in, sorry. Be direct. With all the rehabilitation that you've gone through, and Pine Grove being an independent facility, in 2015 they had a list of things that you needed to do, and that list, I just pulled it up, is actually more extensive in the release. There was 10, 12 items, there's 13 items on the release list. Just on that just on the face of it, 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 it looks like you're the primary agency that has been there from the beginning that as is showing that the something has moved, but they cannot really determine what it is. Okay. But they need all of these elements in place. Maybe you can expand I can that. address that. Um, my first discharge from there, they said I hadn't completed the program. My second discharge there, they said I had completed the program, but I was not yet safe to practice. I, I believe that was it. And then the third time, they said I was safe to practice within a very circumscribed set of circumstances. This is primarily based on the fact that I was not working. Most of the other patients there were all going back to work, and each time they came back, they had another period of time to base their increasing liberalization of the uh, restrictions. Um, each time they actually did liberalize it, but in liberalizing it, they, they described it in further depth as to how to do an increasingly less restricted practice. Yeah, that was interesting. And your opinion, that step-by-step -step approach, because you have not practiced in the, in the target, in the, sp in the environment, in the last five years in which this occurred, right, and you're very self-aware, do you think that is a more prudent approach on the, on the part of Pine Grove? I think they're being very prudent. And, and I said in my last testimony, I don't feel like they want to stick their neck out. Mm -hmm. I feel that I'm doing well with their program, I'm following their program, but um, without a job supervisor to report back about me, they're not willing to just remove all restrictions right away. Yeah, that's my impression too. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well then um, the, uh, the argument is concluded. Uh, and 
uh, we're going to go off the record and uh, Diane, the court reporter, we can get a form from her record. 